Have you ever wondered why you feel so uncomfortable when a homeless person or a panhandler comes up to you asking for money on the street? They have all kinds of approaches. You know, there's the, there's the guy who's at the street corner, you know, where, where the light changes and he's there. Sometimes it's a woman, you know, and they have a cardboard sign, pretty much says the same thing, you know, homeless, out of work, need, need a job, need money, need food, you know. And uh, uh, you have to look at him while the red light is there, you know, because you got no change and you, you, think, you think, wait a minute, all I've got on me is a $20 bill and you're thinking, yeah, maybe I'm not going to depart with my $20 bill. I remember in California, <laughs> there was a guy on the, the main street near where we live, where the church was, he only had one arm. I don't know if he lost it in combat or he was born that way or he lost it in an accident, but he only had one arm, you know, and just a stub on this side. And uh, he never wore a shirt, of course. He always had his shirt off, you know, with his, with his, he didn't have to have a sign. What do you need a sign for? You know, he just sit there with a cup, you know, or a box or something and, um, and ask for change. Or people uh, in Montreal, this was, I, it's not happened to me here, but in Montreal, <clears throat> people just come up to you and ask you for money. You know, I'm having a hard time, buddy, be a friend, you got a dollar to spare, you know, they're right, right in your face. And that makes you uncomfortable. Of course, uh, their clothing and their appearance as well, perhaps if they're really close, the smell, they may push you back, but do you know what really causes that gut reaction that you feel? A little bit of fear, a little bit of guilt mixed together. You know what causes that? The feeling that we experience is caused by the fact that we're seeing poverty, real poverty, up close and personal and we don't like what we see. We don't like what we smell. Not only do we not like what we see in them, their appearance also mirrors in a cruel way, our own affluence and the great distance and difference there is between them and ourselves. There's a human being and I'm a human being and oh, what a difference there is between the two of us. You see, we feel afraid because right there in front of us is our own worst nightmare in the form of this poor, wretched human being. We say to ourselves, oh my, that could be me. That could be me. We feel guilty because in comparison to them, we have everything and they have nothing. And that realization is driven into our hearts as we look away and we walk on. And even if you stop and even if you give some change, the guilt may be lessened, but the fear mixed with this panicky gratitude remains. Such is the experience of being rich in the face of extreme poverty on a very personal level. Now on a larger scale, it's the same. We live in a time and in a nation where we are wealthier than the majority of people in the world now, as well as any other nation since the beginning of history. I mean, despite the threat of war and a shaky economy in comparison to the nearly 7 billion people uh, on this earth, we are the rich ones. We're the rich ones. So when we read the Bible, as Jake read this morning, and it refers to the rich, we need to understand that it's not simply talking about the wealth superstars. 
you know, the Jeff Bezos or the Bill Gates people of this world. That passage in Mark, it's talking to us as a nation, because in our day and in our time and in this world, me, you, we're the rich ones. And the Bible is talking about the rich. <laughs> it's talking about us. So with this in mind, I want to share with you some things that I've been thinking about, things that I've learned as a rich person, because like you, I'm also rich. I want to share with you my own observations about being a rich man in a poor world. Observation number one. There is a saturation point beyond which the accumulation and the consumption of wealth becomes uncomfortable for both my body and my soul. Solomon has something to say about that. He says, have you found honey? Eat only what you need, that you not have it in excess and vomit it. You think that's talking just about honey? It's talking about wealth. It's talking about something precious. In simpler terms, he cautions those with wealth, remember, that's all of us, he cautions us not to overdo it. Be very careful. You see, when you are rich, things get too easy. We want things that are too stylish. Everything has to be elegant. We just get too full from the nonstop emotional and physical gratification that we can afford. We're hungry, we want food, we don't even have to get up and make it. We just take our phone out, punch a bunch of numbers and say, you know, bring me food. <laughs> and 30 minutes later, food arrives, cooked, ready to eat at our door. That's how rich, that's how rich we are. So this is a point where I have to work Excuse me, let me say that again. There is a point where I have to work too hard to justify to my own conscience the difference between the indulgences of my wealth and the emptiness of someone else's poverty. You see, somewhere along the line, it seems immoral to me that we can have 12 pair of shoes when somebody else in the world has to go barefoot. Another observation on being rich in a world of uh, poverty. Being rich requires much more personal discipline. Did you know that? I used to think that wealth brought freedom. You can do what you want when you're rich. But I have since learned that wealth is a demanding taskmaster and it requires personal discipline in order to survive its negative influences. Again, I go to Solomon who comments on this phenomenon in Ecclesiastes chapter five. He says, when good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to their owners except to look on? The sleep of the working man is pleasant, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. Why is that? Well, it's because wealth brings us a greater ability to consume, which in turn requires greater discipline to avoid worldliness, gluttony, sensuality. I have found that wealth creates a demand on my time and my energy and my emotions that increase as my wealth increases. If I've got one car, I worry that you know, the transmission is okay and it'll work. If I have two cars, well, I have two cars to worry about. 
If I've got 15 cars, well, I, I can't even imagine what it is with 15 cars. If I have 15 cars, I got to hire somebody to worry about those. You see what I'm saying? However, I also note that this same wealth does not have the power to purchase more time or more energy or emotional substance to invest into my family or my friends or my present and pursuit of spiritual development what I'm trying to say is that being rich does not contribute to my spirituality. It actually wars against my spirituality. In the end, I realize that wealth requires discipline to deal with my feelings, but it cannot purchase what I need to respond to its demands. In other words, being rich leads me to worldliness, but it will not provide me with any help to deal with this temptation. And then an obvious lesson I learned about being rich. Being rich has made it easier for me to be insensitive to the needs of other people. This time, we read in the book of Luke. It says, now there was a rich man and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. Because if you're rich, you can afford to do that. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and he was buried. In Hades he lifted up his eyes being in torment and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. I want you to note that the rich man in this passage harbored no ill feelings towards the poor beggar, nor was he the one that caused Lazarus's poverty. As a matter of fact, he felt nothing at either way and therein lay his great sin. He didn't feel anything about this guy, uh, poor beggar who was at his gate. And that was the sin. The sin was he didn't feel anything. He was so engrossed in his own wealth that he couldn't see or hear the cry of the poor man even as he lay at his front gate. You know, I often think that in a kind of geopolitical way, the United States is the rich man and Haiti is the poor Lazarus. You know, laying there at our feet, hurricane after hurricane, earthquake after earthquake, you know, disaster after disaster. Oh, he may have actually seen him with his eyes, you know, the rich man, and maybe he was annoyed with his constant begging, but his heart never heard him and his heart never saw him. I've noticed in my own life that being rich causes me to forget what needing is like and needing is what the heart sees and what the heart hears. I don't need to worry about food. I don't need to worry about clothing or housing 
or medical emergency. I don't need to worry about what will happen when I get, wait a minute, I'm already old. Anyways, I don't need to worry about that. Eventually, I don't need you. And you know what? I don't really need God either. Being rich creates a false sense of security, a false sense of independence where I don't have to depend on anyone. And pretty soon, I don't want anyone to depend on me. People depending on me may interfere with my enjoyment of my wealth or worse still, could even mean that I have to share some of my wealth. So I definitely want to stay independent. I definitely want to stay closed off. Why? Because if I'm closed off, I don't have to hear and I don't have to see the ugliness and the need and the poverty of this world. Now in the Middle Ages, when certain wealthy people were faced with the dilemma of being rich in a poor world, uh, and they had a spiritual crisis over it, they would give everything to the Catholic church and they would enter a monastery and live like a monk. Many religious and philosophies are based on the complete renunciation of material wealth. However, the Bible teaches that this practice does not have to, you know, doesn't save your soul, nor is it a guard against greed and pride, nor is it demanded by Christ. And it doesn't solve the problem of poverty. In Colossians 2, 23, Paul says, these are matters which have to be sure, you know, the, the abasement of the body and all that kind of stuff, fasting and, uh, you know, being, uh, uh, ascetic and so on and so forth. He says, these matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement are severe treatment of the body, but they're of no value against fleshly indulgence. This doesn't mean that Christians shouldn't guard themselves against the spiritually debilitating power that possessing wealth has over us. There are certain things that we can do as rich people to maintain a Christian balance as people of wealth in a world of poverty. Things that are given to us by God's word in its instructions and patterns to guide our lives, whether we be rich or poor. And so in order to find spiritual balance as rich people living in a world of poverty, I have a few suggestions. Actually, the Bible has a few suggestions. Suggestion number one, give a minimum of 10% of your gross income to God before you do anything else with your wealth or your paycheck. Now, I believe God used 10% in the Old Testament because he knew whatever the society, whatever the economy, whatever the era, 10% would always be a sacrificial amount to give. 10% would always be the threshold to sacrificial giving. To make it 10% right off the top before taxes or anything else makes it your first portion and because you give the first portion to God, he will bless you in the use of the other 90% that you keep for yourself. By giving him the first, you honor him and you bless yourself. By giving him a minimum of 10%, however, makes it a sacrificial gift, no matter what financial level of wealth you are at. If you make $40,000 a year, $80,000 a year, $2 million a year, if you give 10%, it's a sacrifice every time, no matter what salary level that you're at. Now, don't get me wrong about the 10% figure and think I'm advocating some kind of legalistic 
tithing system here. Tithing is a, is a rule of the old law about giving. We're not, under, we're not under the law, we're under grace. I'm proposing, uh, excuse me, I'm not proposing any kind of tithing system. I'm encouraging sacrifice in your giving to God. That's what I'm encouraging. For expediency's sake, I'm saying to you that for most people, a minimum of 10% given from the top would require sacrifice. I'm saying to you, go ahead, sacrifice. The Lord will be honored and your soul will be a little safer from the influence of greed and worldliness. Go ahead, give at least 10% and inoculate yourself against the deadly virus of greed and worldliness, much more dangerous than COVID. Another point of advice about being rich in a world of poverty. Examine the amount of time and energy your pursuit of wealth consumes in comparison to the time and energy used up in the service of others, like family, like the church, like the community. Anxiety and restlessness and unhappiness usually goes up as we spend more of our time getting richer and less of our time in the service to other people. Public generosity and service shields us against the envy of others. Private sacrificial giving and quiet behind the scenes help and service protects your conscience from Satan's trap of false guilt because of a blessed and abundant life. I could preach a whole other sermon on the idea that Satan also takes advantage of us because we're rich. And we're rich because God has blessed us. And what I'm talking about this morning is not you know, a diatribe against being rich. We're rich because God has blessed us. I'm saying, let's be careful because we are rich, let's do certain things to make sure that our wealth doesn't consume us. And finally, for those who are rich in a poor world, be continually thankful. We don't know why we're the rich ones and not the poor ones. Why is it that we're here and the Haitians are there? We have brothers and sisters in Christ who believe the same thing we do, who are immersed in the water in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins, who go to services three times a week, you know, who, who pray before their meals, whose hope is in Christ, who sing the same songs we sing, who have the same hope that we have, who make the same prayers that we make, and yet they live in cardboard boxes. And yet their country is hit year after year with degrading uh, illnesses and tornadoes and you know, hurricanes, everything under the sun. Why, why them and not us? We're sitting here, we're sitting pretty. We have tornado shelters. We have tornado shelters and we have insurance. So we can climb out of our shelter and the insurance guy comes and we say, you see the pad over there? Yeah, that's where my house used to be. Oh, okay, fine. And we get a check and we hire somebody and he rebuilds us a new house. Doesn't happen like that in Haiti. We're not supposed to ask why, that's the thing. God blesses us with wealth, not so we will question and feel guilty about it. He blesses us so that we might enjoy not only the material world he has created for us, but also the pleasure that comes from sharing and managing our wealth for him and knowing the joy that comes from praising him with a thankful heart. His blessings are a continued cause for my rejoicing 
and my praising of him. I don't feel guilty because I'm rich. I feel humbled. I feel humbled. I have no idea in the world why I am rich. All I can do is give thanks. That's all I can do is say thank you and do my best to share what I have with those who are in need. What we give away, whether it be at church or privately, is given so that others can also know of God's love and experience this same joy of praise and thanksgiving from a happy heart. These are some of the things that I've learned from being a rich person in a world of poverty. Of course, the most valuable thing we possess is our soul's salvation. It is so valuable, so priceless, that there's nothing in the world, no material thing in existence that we can exchange for it. We may be rich in material things, but there will all, these all will turn to dust one day when Jesus returns. The question then will be, are you rich in salvation? The question needs to be resolved now so that it can be answered properly later. Are you rich in salvation? Is the blood of Christ continually cleansing you? Have you received God's most precious blessing yet? It is so ironic that people will literally work and worry themselves to death in order to gain things that quickly break down and turn to dust in time. And yet they ignore or reject the one thing that will last forever and given to everyone for free. Don't be fooled by riches and glitter of this temporary world. Come for the precious and eternal gift of forgiveness through repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus and come for the eternal life offered by God through faith in Jesus Christ and come for ministry or prayer or help in his name to deal with your wealth in a world of poverty. If these invitations are calling your heart, then we encourage you to respond this morning as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement, shall we?